Hi there. So, as Carolyn said, the Carliner Award uh, in Public Interest Law recognizes rising stars in immigration rights, civil rights, civil liberties, or international human rights law. It honors David Carliner, a civil rights and immigration lawyer who battled Jim Crow, who battled for the rights of gay federal workers and for immigrants, for asylees, and for human rights abroad. The award comes with a $10,000 prize and an additional $2,500 for the winner's organizations. So can I get a show of hands of who that terrible last weekend of January, after Donald Trump issued his outrageous Muslim ban, who, who among you went to an airport? Well, tonight's David Carliner Award. Tonight's David Carliner Award honors the person who, more than anyone else, made that possible, coordinated that work, Becca Heller of the Immigrant and Refugee Assistance Project, IRAP. So I want to give you a, a sense of the work that, that Becca did that weekend. Five o'clock on Friday, January 27th, Trump signed his executive order, which, as you may remember, nobody knew the contents of until after he signed it. By 5.30 a.m. Saturday, so 12 and a half hours later, Becca had filed a class action habeas petition. By 4 o'clock that afternoon, so under 24 hours, she had moved for a nationwide stay. And by 9.37 p.m. That, that Saturday, she and her team and her colleagues had won a nationwide stay, saving at least 750 people from being deported. So because I am one of the few non-lawyers in the room. I, I am the one with the least expertise in this. I am, I will read, I'm going to read to you a, a short uh, comment from Michael Wishney, uh, who, who wrote Becca's uh, the letter of recommendation for this, for this award. None of this, none of what I just described, would have happened without Becca's judgment, leadership, and vision for change. She was the single indispensable person quarterbacking the entire effort of lawyers, volunteers, protesters, media, and politicians, pushing us all forward, verifying facts. Somehow, Becca's energy, insight, judgment, humor, passion, and creativity pulled us all, really, much of the nation, forward from the abyss of that first week of the new administration and into the renewed belief that progressive humanitarian change is still possible. So I want to make two points before uh, letting Becca talk. The first is that none of this, none of what I have described, would have been possible without the ordinary work that Becca Heller does and continues to do in addition to her fighting the Muslim ban. That's how she knew that she had clients on the planes to the United States that Friday night. That's how she had a network of lawyers and law students around the country to fight them. So this is not just a one-time thing. This is a, a lifetime, a career of building this organization. And the, the second point I would make, which is the point that I, again, as the non-lawyer, have been making a lot, is that the work of that weekend, the, re the heroic, exciting, cinematic work of that weekend, crucially required lawyers, and it crucially required non-lawyers, the, the, pr the pride I felt as an American that Americans, lawyers, politicians, media, and everyday citizens and non-citizens went to airports, knew that when people are being arbitrarily arrested and detained at airports unfairly and unconstitutionally, you go to where they are detained and you demand their freedom. And that is what we did and that is what Becca Heller led us to do and helped us to do successfully. So, Becca, if you'll come up. 
and welcome Becca Heller. talk really loud. I'm going to move these back for me a little bit. I, I heard somewhere that people in D.C. started drinking at 10 a.m. this morning when Comey testified. So a lot of them, probably more of them are in this room than who went to the airport, apparently. It's, priorities are important. Uh, so I'll try to be engaging for those of you who have been doing that. Um, first off, thank you to ACS to the Carliner family, and in particular to David Carliner for his fearless work. It is truly an honor to receive a prize in his name. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to the organizers of this presentation. Originally, I had to speak after Steve Bright, um, and now the order has been changed, and that's a big relief for me, and you will see why. <laughs> no one should be judged by the worst thing they ever did. I have all night. <laughs> you, you don't. So once upon a time, uh, when I thought we had the worst president we were ever going to have, in the summer of 2008, <laughs> those were the days, I was doing a, an internship between my 1L and 2L years of law school in Israel. And long story short, the internship wasn't working out, largely because, as it turns out, in Israel, the law is practiced in Hebrew, <laughs> which I would have known if Yale Law School had taught me anything at all, <laughs> or if I could use the internet. So I was sitting in this air-conditioned office in Tel Aviv watching Mad Men, but at the time, there had only been two seasons, so I ran out really quickly, and then I was looking for a way to make myself useful. And I kept hearing about all of these Iraqi refugees who were in Jordan. So I got this idea that as a US citizen, I wanted to learn about the humanitarian fallout of my country's foreign policy. And I emailed everyone I could think of and through a very attenuated series of people um, that I now realize included some sort of sketchy people. Uh, not because refugees are sketchy. Let's, let's just footnote that with a big asterisk. I was able to go to Jordan and meet with six refugee families. And I was prepared to see humanitarian crisis. I had spent two years before law school working with um, people dying of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. I expected to find people who were hungry, who didn't have access to proper housing or sanitation, who couldn't access education. And those things were all true. But what surprised me the most is that every single family I met independently identified their primary problem as legal. I don't know if you guys know the song Closing Time, if you came of age in the 90s. It has this, yeah, the 90s. There was a different president then, too. It has a line that I think sort of perfectly encapsulates the refugee crisis from a pop culture perspective, which is, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. But your only way out is to navigate this crazy legal system that involves hours of interviews, hundreds of pages of paperwork, and on which, at the end of the day, your life quite literally depends. And everyone I met seemed to believe that they were on some kind of wait list, that if they could just hang in there long enough, one day they'd wake up and they'd get a call from the US or Australia or Canada saying, your number's up, congratulations, get on a plane. And at the end of the week, I wanted to do something more useful than my original plan, which has been to write some kind of like op-ed in the New Haven Register or another bastion of investigative journalism. <laughs> and so I finagled a meeting with the US Embassy uh, by faking a visa issue with my passport, because it turns out that the only phone line that's actually answered at the US Embassy in Amman is consular services for US citizens. <laughs> for which you should be grateful if you ever find yourself in Jordan with an actual passport issue. 
And I went to this meeting and I was like, you know, I'm this law student, I'm sort of interested in this refugee situation you guys have going on there. And they're like, let us get you someone from public affairs. And they called in someone from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and they're sort of talking me through the program, which at the time made no sense, it turns out, because it makes no sense. <laughs> and at the end I was like, all right, so how long is the wait list? I felt like at the very least, a thing that I could give to these families was, you know, if you can hang in there six months, eight months, a year and a half, you can get on a plane, right? You have something to look forward to. And they said, what wait list? And I've thought about that a lot, not just because it's a really appropriate metaphor for a lot of points that I'm trying to make. I don't think that the wait list is a nefariously propagated, made up rumor by the embassy and the UN to placate people. I think it is a rumor that came from within the refugee community because if you live at the bottom of a deep, dark hole, in order to get out of bed in, in the morning, you have to believe that there's some kind of light at the top. And the fact that the light at the top, the gleaming hope that people had created for themselves, was the epitome of an inefficient and ineffective bureaucracy struck me as so tragic that I decided I should probably try to do something about it. So I got back to school and myself and another student, John Finer, co-founded this group that was then called the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project. That was in September of 2008. Today, they were called the International Refugee Assistance Project. We work with over 2,000 lawyers and law students from 30 law schools and 80 law firms, representing thousands of clients from 55 different countries seeking safety. We passed eight pieces of federal legislation in the past five years that have benefited 160,000 refugees, including getting 2,500 visas for Afghan allies of the US whose lives are at risk into the omnibus spending bill, which if you're keeping track at home, is one more piece of federal legislation than President Trump has passed this year. Yeah. And after the president was elected, we spent a lot of time thinking, what are we gonna do with this huge network of law students and lawyers and as was very uh, lovely articulated, um, the president gave us an answer when he issued the Muslim ban on January 27th. So we said, none of you are doing anything, you should go to the airport. And the rest, as they say, is a little bit of history. And I spend a little bit of time, a lot of time, because I'm neurotic, thinking about why did that moment work? And I think at the end of the day, that moment worked because people showed up. Not just lawyers showed up, non-lawyers showed up and protested. The movement came and let's face it, it's really unusual for the lawyers to go first and then the movement to follow, <laughs> right? Usually we're following behind in green hats. I love you, NLG. I love my green hat. Brings out my eyes. People could have slept or stayed at home and watched it on Twitter, but instead, people all over the country left their apartment if you live in New York, if your house, if you live anywhere else, and went to the airport. <laughs> and they said, you cannot turn the airport into a black site. You cannot take anyone arriving from a predominantly Muslim country or anyone who's arriving who's a refugee and lock them up without access to counsel or access to the light of day and just hold them indefinitely. And now, every time someone talks about the first executive order in the news or in the inevitable law reviews that will come or in the inevitable Supreme Court decision, knock on wood, it's always followed by the sentence which led to chaos at the airports. And I'm so proud because we were that chaos. <laughs> And to bastardize a very popular quote by Mahatma Gandhi, be the chaos you wish to see in the world. <laughs> they only gave me five minutes and I'm gonna go over because that's how I roll. But I wanna, I wanna finish with a, a brief pontification on resistance. Resistance is the new black. I have lawyer friends who spend all day working on mergers and acquisitions deals for major corporations, claim that they don't have time for pro bono, then post something mocking Trump on the Pantsuit Nation Facebook page and call themselves resistors. <laughs> don't get me wrong, this is a decent start. 
If there's one silver lining to all of this, it's that even corporate lawyers and hipster millennials are getting a little woke. <laughs> People are starting to care, and that's step one. To quote the famous constitutional law scholar, the Lorax, <laughs> unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. But step two is that resistance has to mean something. David Carliner was fond of saying, you should never be afraid of being called an agitator because in a washing machine, it's the agitator that gets the dirt out. <laughs> and when... And when Jacob originally emailed me that quote, it turned out that I didn't understand how a washing machine worked. <laughs> my husband's always like, you're good at some things. <laughs> In short, the time for idle chatting and tweeting and posting is over. The threats that we face require action. So I implore you, over the next two days of the conference, or once you get back to school, or your work, or your computer, or your courtroom, act up, disrupt, zealously advocate. If you are stuck for ideas, feel free to call me. IRAP can always use more lawyers. I, that's real. <laughs> but I'm glad it was cute. I want to close with a quote from Frederick Douglass. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you so much.